Right, okay. Um, those, that, those that, um, obviously, when we go to the break, those that don't want their face seen because this is being recorded, you just need to just put your, your uh, camera off. But um, it doesn't matter at this minute because um, you're not being recorded and I can't see you either. So, um, right. So what we're going to do, Dell, you know that, uh, that little tool that I've been using? All right, yeah. Oh, I love it. Do you know, it, it makes me feel like an artist. Right, so what do we know about Pablo Benito from your sense, um, Del? Oh, is it the one in Colorado, Arizona way? That's Mese Verde. This is, um, Pablo Benito is the one in Chaco Canyon. Right. This, this, is, this, is, this is the one shaped like a D with a load of houses. Right. Right. Um, so. I, I won't bring aliens into it. Uh, um, I it's probably not a good idea <laughs> right so um, what we're bas what we're basically looking at is um a civilization that was was at the height of its powers um probably around a thousand years ad um and about 150 200 years later it was a civilization that had collapsed um and the metaphor for this civilization is today um this civilization saw plenty it, it took and used all its resources and suddenly it was left one day with um, a wonderfully built um, civilization, but with no um, agriculture, with no water, um, with absolutely nothing. In fact, it exhausted its landscape. It had exhausted its environment. Um, and to be honest with you, it's about time we started learning from past civilizations. Uh, this civilization, um, started to react more and more when we think about it it established um a little miniature town um in chaco canyon um in chaco canyon where we will show you where that is in new mexico um there were there were other um such um little towns like this um those that dwell on the plain of chaco canyon those that uh, dwelled in the cliff of chaco canyon um and you know it was it was part of a landscape that was dominated by um, a feminine ideal um, and when I say a feminine ideal it it looks like it, it was um, a population that that followed um, a non warlike um, future, and then eventually everything changed um, and that 's another part of the history. We got loads of nice little archaeological tidbits today, and um, a little bit more different than usual. So before, um, before further ado, if we, if we start looking at um, this screen, um, from down this level, it's almost subterranean. Um, this level above is about, above ground level. And when you think about it down here, it's going to be nice um, and cool. And this is the type of thing that was being evolved within these um, um, Pueblos. Um, Pueblo... Um, Pueblo basically means town or people. Benito means beautiful. So Pueblo Benito, the town or the people or the beautiful people. Um, and when we think about them building this, these individual towns over the um, point of 300 years, um, as I say, they had plenty, they had all the resources and they wore them out. A bit like what we're doing today. Um, and to be honest with you, when I started researching this, I started to get very angry. And I started to get very angry because I started thinking, well, once we had um, endless woodlands and forests in the Brecon Beacons and Snowdonia, and now for me personally, it's an ugly, barren landscape with no trees. Um, and I know some people don't like me saying that the Brecon Beacons and Snowdonia is a horrible, arid, uh, pointless landscape with no trees, but that's what I feel. And this is a, this landscape in Chaco Canyon was completely uh, full of trees at one point. And by the, by the point that they had completed their town, there was one single tree left. And that is very sad. They had exhausted all the trees by building this um, town. They had exhausted all the trees by burning um, excess uh, wood. Um, and when they got to the point of thinking, right, we need, we need to expand, there was one tree left. And this here is classed as the tree of life. Now, um, in, the, in the background, 
you have this cliff, hang on, this cliff here, um, which is rather important to us because um, this settlement was built very near the cliff. And it was only in 1941 that the cliff collapsed um, and the buildings that had once been standing um, on this side associated with the cliff uh, were crushed by the collapsing cliff in 1941. Up until that point, this cliff associated with Pablo Benito was still standing. Um, and why is that significant? Well, the people building Pablo Benito over a thousand years ago knew the vulnerability of this cliff. But the difference is the cliff was held together by moisture. By the time 1941 comes along, this was nothing but an arid, arid, empty landscape with n hardly any life at all which meant to the collapse of the cliff. Now, this is a, naturally a reconstruction of um, Pablo Benito, um, but this image of the cliff in the background is taken from a photograph um, of what this looked like in 1940. These um, interesting things here, um, and I'm gonna change my font, uh, these interesting things here are called kivas. Um, and it's good that Pat's just joined us because these are very similar to the brochs in Scotland. Lots of archaeologists believe that these kivas are in fact forms of community centres where people would meet, because in most of these there's no signs of any fire, fires. These are just spaces that were almost lit by lamps. Um, so what we need to do, if we go on a little bit further, um, and I love, I love my scribbling, now, um, if I said to you turquoise, what would I be talking about, Dell? Uh, Semi-precious stone. That's all I wanted. Uh, what, what, would you, what, is, what is this? Um, what is this here? It looks like um, effigy of a parrot. Well, it's not an effigy of a parrot. It's, um, it's a skull of a parrot, a macau. Um, interestingly enough, their, dom their landscape was dominated by these wonderful large parrots. Um, and they lived amongst the trees because parrots live amongst trees, don't they? They don't sort of live in open landscapes and so on. They lived in amongst those trees. So they were revered. And then one day, like the people of Easter Island, they woke up and there were no more trees. And again, this is the tragedy of civilizations that managed to get to the height of their being, um, they, they, they built structures that were five stories tall, five stories, or if you're in America, four stories tall, um, or is it the other way around? Never mind. Um, but the point is, um, we, we see plenty. We, we absolutely see plenty in abundance. And it's all seen in the sense of um, the buildings that we see in Chaco Canyon, in Mesa Verde, um, and the other canyons that exist with, with these beautiful senses of, of civilization. And now they're just seen in deserts. And in a way, in many ways, um, this can be compared with those, those great cities in North Afri Africa, like Leptus Magna, where you had these great cities and Carthage as well, where you had these great cities. And I've, um, connection's a bit faint a minute, so I'll just stop. You had these great cities um, in North Africa, and because the landscape became exhausted, um, you know, the city stopped functioning. And if anyone wants to argue with me that the, um, that the phenomenon of um, the Sahara Desert is natural, um, don't, because most of what we do see with Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde is man-induced. They, they completely devastated all the resources. However, if you, if, you, if you want to be really condescending, let's not be condescending on American civilization because there were civilizations in the tropical rainforest until those damnable Spanish and Portuguese got there, um, the Amazon basin, um, where what we see is they, they believe that tens of millions of people used to live in the Amazon basin. And the way they used to survive was quite simple. Um, they used to survive within um, um, the jungle setting they used to use the resources and the head of the village, um, usually after about seven years, that's usually about right, would turn around to say, everybody, 
we have got we have reached a point that we can plant our crops that we can harvest the animals that we that we've got this beautiful little village tomorrow we're moving um and we know that that is happening because some of the communities um some of those peoples within the amazon basin um the archaeologists will say well hang on a minute um why you you know ethno ethnographers have said to them hang on a minute you, you've got a beautiful village here so why are you moving and they would turn around and say well the reason why we're moving is that we don't want to be westernized and the archaeologists have never been able to work this out and then they suddenly turned around and understood that when you get to a level of plenty there will be a point that the level of plenty will suddenly collapse so what the people in the Amazon basin would be, they would be moving to another place, starting a new village. They would start using the resources there and then they would move on again. Uh, they wouldn't exhaust them. Um, unfortunately, the people um, like the Anastasi, like the people of Pablo Benito, like the people of Mesa Verde, like the people of Arizona, like the people of New Mexico, all those people, they, they, they were acting very different than the Amazon, Amazonian mindset. They were working very differently than the other peoples in the landscape, even those, those Apache type people in the landscape, very different from the likes of the Mohican um, up in the um, Northeast, for example, who, who would use some of the resources and would never exhaust them. People who lived in the trees, I call them. But these were people who lived in the trees, um, wiped out the trees and found 300 years into their civilization that they could no longer support themselves. And in fact, we are seeing the same in our modern day civilization and we have not learned. And you know, it makes me so angry that we are so stupid as human beings that we can't look in the archeology span and see our mistakes being made over and over again. Um, so what you, can, what you can see in front of us now um, is um, a three sets of their material culture, um, terracotta statues, turquoise and their pottery. Um, these all represent trade, technology, these all represent communication, daily life, and not the word subsistence. Subsistence is when you are now struggling, trying to make a lifestyle, and then you move on. And subsistence is basically the way that normal um, American populations work within, those, within the woodlands. Um, you know, um, they subside with their resources around them, and, and that's the best way to be never exhaust it clear again now one thing that we can one thing that we can say is that we know associated with these people at chaco canyon if they've got similarities with other cultures on the planet um, and the similarities are um, the spiral we, we know that the people of Chaco Canyon were basically like the sand people of South Africa or very much like the um, Nazca people of South America or very much like um, the original peoples that occupied Egypt. Um, you know, peoples that were subsiding in subsistence with the landscape around them. And, you know, the, the spiral is the spiral of um, um, everlasting life. And the spiral of everlasting life, as I've already said, is a repeated theme. We know that the people of Pablo Benito, Chaco Canyon, were like any other peoples that were respecting the environment. This is why they draw such art like this. This is why the Aboriginal um, draw art like this, because it's very much part of themselves. It's very much part of their being. And then things go wrong. So, um, what you can, what you've basically got, and this will be very familiar to Pat. Uh, you know, she's got friends in Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, and the place that we're actually looking at today is, if we can go here, is this wonderful landscape. Mesa Verde is um, a bit sort of further north. Um, and then this is the one that we'll be actually looking at today, Pueblo Benito. Um, the thing is, what we're talking about is within a very small landscape of North America. Um, and when you start to look at the very um, complex geometry 
and the very complex linear line associated with Pablo Benito. This is very much a high culture as opposed to a high culture that never existed in North America. However, I am very wrong with that. A high culture does not have to be met with civilizations that are building cities. A high culture has to be met with the understanding of resources and to be able to know um, your ability to manage those resources. So what we're going to talk about is the likes of the Mohican are as high culture as these people who built Pueblo Benito, but they were of high culture in a different way. The sense of understanding. When um, it said that somebody that, that can balance and understand um, makes somebody a person that, that can um, be respected, somebody that can um, continue amongst all the hardships. And when we want to feel angry, um, it's looking at civilizations like this. And because they, they once had so much going for them. They had a river. The entire landscape around them was full of trees. Um, the rest of the landscape was full of trees. But now when you go there today, it's an arid landscape. How's this making you feel, Del? Yeah, it's quite sad, isn't it? That um, they've used all their resources. Yes, it is. And, you know, it makes, you, what makes me wonder how were the last people living and, you know, who decided to move away? Now, this is, this is one structure that we, we're not going to look at, the one at Mesa Verde. And um, the reason why we're not looking at this today is because it's another whole story associated with complete disappearance. Now, the, these lectures today, the, the ones that we'll be doing over the next few months, and we've, we've done the Teutonberg so far, are to be looking at disasters in archaeology looking at civilizations that, like, like Rome, they, they, their legions are massacred in the Teutonberg Forest. Um, and and the, one, the one backdrop of this, I know it may, may, may sound a bit funny, but put a smile on your face, but the Indiana Jones films, for example, the, the first backdrop that we get from the Indiana Jones um, uh, films are, are the backdrop um, of New Mexico, the, the archaeology of New Mexico. And you've got treasure seekers looking in buildings like this, um, for I think it's the uh, Cross of Cortez at the beginning of the film Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, and it's basically in this backdrop that you're thinking how are these things being found out there when, when it's just nothing but a barren landscape but these weren't barren landscapes back in the day um, and one point to be made quickly um, is, is the sense um, of this writing in front of us up until the 1100s, the, the society at Pueblo Benito, phase one, phase two, pay, phase three, was dominated um, by a sense of femini femininity, a sense that we don't need to have defensive walls. We don't need to fight with other people. We've got everything. We've got all our resources. Then after this period, things change. The male mindset starts to take over. The male mindset of control, the, main, my, the male mindset of um, wishing to um, conquer other people's territories, at which point the, the, these peoples and their society collapsed. Now, when you look at this image, you've got to really get an idea of, of you've got to look at this and you've got to think, right, what am I looking at? And what you're looking at is um, these, these here, the blackness is caused by the walls surviving. Those are the shadows created by the tall walls. It's said that the walls of Pueblo Bonito once stood 30 meters high, which is, which, is as, which is as high as a tall spire on a church. 30 meters high, all made out of stone, um, using, using a mortar mix, rendered on the outside, rendered on the inside, um, and these people were aware of this, um, a cliff that one day collapsed um, on um, uh, Pablo Benito itself, not in ancient times, but in January 1941. Um, and it's quite interesting I say that because uh, it's more proof as well that this was a lush valley once because it, it was the moisture that kept the rock together. 
when the moisture dried out so much after 100 years um, after this site was abandoned, suddenly the cliff fractures and collapses on Pueblo Benito. So these people were well aware of the dangers of this cliff, but it wasn't a danger to them back in the day. When we, when we again look at this uh, plan, we can actually see it in two sections. Um, and the sense of the two sections is that it's likely it may have been built um, with a sense of division. But then again, what is division is the community space, which was opposed to this community space, which was opposed to this wall, which divided the wall between this wall. So in other words, anything in archeology span is a sense of division um, and a difference between that family and this family. Are we talking about hierarchy? I tendency to go away from hierarchy when I'm talking about a site like this, when we still got so much to learn. So what I might do is I might show you one more image um, and then we'll cut the screen sharing and I've got a nice little bit of text that I'd like to read out to you. However, have you ever been to Cyprus, Del? No, never. Right. Have you ever been to places where you see villages abandoned like this? Where you get uh, the... No. Right. Okay. Okay. When, well, I, I've been to Cyprus and um, my parents have, have got a house in Cyprus. Um, and in 1974, 1975, um, there, there was a war in Cyprus between the Turks and between the Greek Cypriots in the south. Um, and basically that meant that whole towns were abandoned, like um, Farm Augusta um, and parts of the modern day capital Nicosia. And what you see there today is buildings like this, buildings that were abandoned in 1974, 1975. But the difference is these are buildings that were abandoned over 700 years ago and they are still standing today. In fact, there was so much more standing of them until the cliff actually collapsed. And these, my friend, are not windows. They are, in fact, doorways. Um, there are no windows associated with these buildings um, because they, they lived a subterranean lifestyle. As, as, as the conditions within their landscape changed, they started to build upwards in you know, large tower blocks five stories in height, 30 meters in height. Um, and with that said, um, these people um, lived a complex life on the ground level um, with different doorways linking different rooms. Um, a sense of maybe that was their habitation, maybe that was their storage. The problem is with five stories, when five stories of a building collapse, all the archaeology, which was in different layers and different rooms, have all been smashed into one. So it's very difficult to work out where this person, where these people were living, and where those people weren't, and so on. So, if we can move on to another drawer and another image, um, you know, one thing that gets me wrong, gets me riled about archaeologists, um, what they do, they say, right. People lived in Chaco Canyon. This is what it looked like back in the day. And then it's, and it says in their own notes that there was once a river. And the archaeologists also say that this was also full of trees. And also there were trees over here. So if you're going to try and reconstruct a landscape, landscape, you start with a little settlement in a clearing. And then they start to build this huge complex um, after the 850s. Um, and that is that wonderful tree. So what, what with one, one, key, one key thing that you can actually see is there are no defensive walls around it. Um, it's just high wall buildings. There's no defensive walls. And this itself is the very sacred tree of life. So by about a thousand years ago, it's very likely that most of the trees in Chaco Canyon had already been removed. And the problem is building these higher isn't possible because the most of the um, load bearing timbers that they would have used 
a hundred years earlier and now gone. And how do we know that? This tree. Because we've got um, part of the, they excavated where the tree was and they've actually got a sample of the tree and you could actually, um, we've got a section of that coming up. It's absolutely fascinating. And these are some of the, the trade goods. So obviously what we do find is we've got um, the turquoise um, the beads for necklaces. You can use these for bracelets. Um, and look at this. This is almost as if, you know, when, when um, I think I can remember in my parents' house, they used to have a, like a little glass um, a beaker, which was a bit like this, where you would glue stones on the outside. Surely, Dow, you, you can remember doing that. You ever done anything like that yes. with your children? Yeah? yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, so um, that's it. Exactly. That's on terracotta. So this is a turquoise, sort of um, little bits of turquoise glued on the terra. Um, well, when I say glued, they, um, they would have used resin. Um, and obviously all these shells have come from the coast. So what they're doing, they're trading this with people on the coast. Um, and obviously we've got evidence of them making bracelets from these types of shells. So, now again, looking into the depths of Pablo Benito. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna, um, we're gonna take a break from these images, but before we take a break from these images, um, one, one, key, one key factor to this is that you can see doorways leading out of the main um, town directly outside. Now, if that's not a defensive wall, because they didn't need one, their mindsets were different. They were differently wired than, than other people's. And what you can see here, some of the floor levels of the first floor still intact. These kivas, that would probably be a main meeting hall. And these main meeting halls. It could be said that some of these lesser ones may have actually been used for storing grain. However, when we do look at another image, you actually see a seating arrangement in them. Uh, initially, things would have been okay. Um, they would have had enough water. Um, they would have had plenty. And to have actually constructed this, they would have had needed enough liquid to actually mix the mortar in the first place. So all these sort of factors come into play to try and understand what, what we're talking about. And over here, would have been that great mighty tree that um, unfortunately um, no longer with us today. Now I tell you what, if that tree survived today, it would give us so much information. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, anyone who doesn't want their, um, their face recorded uh, needs to turn off their thingamajig now, their, their camera, because I'm gonna look at my notes. Then again, I might not need to do that. So what are you still seeing on your screen? Del? We've got uh, the web look. You can't see what I'm, you can't see my notes in front of me. That's I can't good. see you. Oh, that's fine. Um, if anything changes from the plan that you're looking in front of you, let me know, okay? Okay. So, Pueblo Bonito, beautiful town. Do you know, I love the Spanish language because um, in the Spanish language, it's word for word. So Bonito, um, Pueblo, beautiful town, word for word, I love it. Um, in New Mexico, um, dendrochronology, radiocarbon dating, probably dendrochronology, tells us a date of around 828 to 1126 um, AD. So a period of about 300 years. Um, and the one thing about that rock face that you can see um, in the foreground on the left, that, that, was, that was still part of the rock face in 1941. Um, and that collapsed. It was, it was known as the threatening rock. It collapsed. Um, no, the leaning rock gap. So it just basically collapsed and it destroyed. Well, the archaeologists had lovingly excavated and consolidated in the 1920s. From all the archaeological evidence, it tells us that um, the walls were 30 meters in height and 
um, it said and approximated that the main sort of high wall around the whole precinct was a was a um, uh, was weighed in total weight of around thirty thousand tons, and that was the stone just in that sort of outer wall that you can actually see, which is then connected to the other walls. Um, early excavations didn't tell us about the cocoa link with Mexico. The excavations at two thousand nine tell us of um, a link with Mexico 1,200 miles south. Um, and they traded, the, the um, people of the Maya traded Cocoa with the people of Pueblo Benito um, um, a thousand years ago. And we, what we do, we see traces on the pottery that the archeologists have excavated in 2009. Um, how many rooms did Pablo Benito, how many, you, you've got to think of that, that whole thing that you're looking at as one building, but it's a town. It's estimated by archeologists that had 800 rooms spread over an area of three acres. You know, it's a tiered structure. Uh, in my notes, it says a village, but it, it's a town, you know. Um, it was originally found in 1849 by a certain Lieutenant James Simpson. Um, and it was only until 1896, 1900, that they started excavating there. Um, and it was fine. However, when they started excavating there, people started taking the artifacts. Um, and when people started taking the artifacts, it helped us lose information about this very important um, Pablo. And the problem is when you excavate a structure like this, the, the, the um, the earth and the sand that's holding up the walls now, since the timbers rotted away in some parts, it means that the building walls are destabilized, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Um, and then somebody in um, 1904 filed possession of Pablo Benito. Um, even though the federal government said stop excavating, he had enough artifacts that he excavated to actually sell to tourists who are actually visiting the valley. So this is the thing, you know, people, are, are tourists are going into the valley and, they need, and they're buying things. So thousands of artifacts are, are, are being sold off from this wonderful archaeological resource. It's so, it's so good that Mesa Verde was um, left a little bit longer to be found, um, simply because it wasn't looted as badly as this site. But nevertheless, we get all the wonderful walls um, of this um, Pueblo. Um, so... How, how, how many people do we think actually lived here um, with the 800 rooms? Some archaeologists estimate about 1,000 people. Um, and it's likely that if you look at it that way, there may have been 12 large families spread over the, spread over the landscape. Each of those circular kivas may represent one family. Um, and they all met in there. Um, that's what one theory is. However. A little bit more about the environmental impact and everything that we're talking about at this site. Now, I have said many things um, that could be concluded as if I'm imagining, um, based on the archaeological evidence, assuming, but unfortunately I'm not. Because archaeologists have examined other things. Um, living outside the uh, Pablo, um, there were lots of middens. Uh, there, there were lots of, living outside the Pablo, were lots of pack rats um, who created lots of middens. And in amongst those middens, um, from before people built Pablo Benito, slowly going to the end of Pablo Benito, they measured the levels of, of pine leaves in these pack rat middens. And slowly but surely, there's less and less pine leaves, less and less pine cones and to the end of um, the period that people the high stage of Pueblo Benito by about 1150 um, there's very little in the sense of litter um, very very little in the sense of pine leaves being found in these pack rat middens middens coming to the um, conclusion that the ponderosa pines were once plentiful and widespread throughout Chaco Canyon um, uh, Valley and by the end uh, of the height of Pueblo Benito, um, all the trees were gone. 
scientists have hypothesized that during the time when the Pueblo was inhabited, the valley was cleared of almost all of the trees other than the one that we can clearly know about for construction, for fuel, or just because they felt like doing it. Um, this tree removal combined with a period of drought led the water table in the valley to drop severely, making the land infertile. This explains why while, while, um, Pablo Benito was inhabited for 300 years and after that, the effects of this, like the Anastasi, no longer able to grow crops to sustain the population, simply had to move on. And where they went, well, Dell would tell us that they were all kidnapped by aliens. Where they went, <laughs> we do not know. Um, well, I said it, not you. So um, You're lucky Glenn does not you. It, it was all constructed. It, this was constructed by aliens, and the aliens then took them all away. So, um, so what we do have from 2004, um, we've got 300,000 uh, 300, artifacts that have now been um, examined. Um, and this is the largest assemblage of artifacts from any site in the Chaco Canyon. Albeit that there are other sites like um, Pablo Benito and the Chaco Canyon, this is far by the greatest. Now, a, la a little bit of information um, about, uh, about the rooms. Um, if, you, if you focus on the map and you actually see one of the rooms and you look down in it, um, these individual rooms um, were structured in five tiers, five levels, like a multi-story block of flats. In the lowest level, um, uh, underneath the floor, um, people were buried. This is where they buried their loved ones. Only special loved ones, mind you. Um, and the reason why I'm mentioning that is that in one building that was believed to be used by one family uh, within that complex, it's said for over 330 years, they found the remains of 13 individuals underneath the, the floor level there. Uh, this, this was an earthen script, uh, crypt. And it's saying that what, examination of one of the individuals tells us um, that um, one of the men died violently. Well, that's the only evidence of somebody dying violently in room 33. And in room 33, buried underneath the floor, they found thousands of turquoise and shell beads and pendants um, for necklaces, anklets, and bracelets. Um, and this is, this is a very rich burial because it's you know, got all the trappings of somebody important. The other 12 individuals are equally buried in an elite similar way. Um, and the analysis of nine of these individuals um, shared the same mitochondrial DNA, meaning they were all related through the female line. In other words, this was a female dominated society in the first 300 years of the site's use. Um, obviously, after, after about the 1150s, things start to decay and go wrong at Pablo Benito, but we don't really look at that. Um, this was an elite um, line of females, a powerful family who inherited their status from their mothers. Um, the room itself um, tell us that there's a sense of succession within individual families. And maybe, in a way, all of these 12 families at Pueblo Benito um, had, a, had a hierarchy, which was part of the overall hierarchy of Pueblo Benito itself. Some families bigger than other families. So what I'd like to do now is get back to where I was. Um, so does it, is this all making sense, Del? Yes, it is. Um... The burials inside the buildings remind me of um, some ruins in Turkey. Um, Chatelhoyuk. Ch Ch yeah, you got it, Chatelhoyuk. And I, actually, one interesting thing about Chatelhoyuk um, <clears throat> is that, that, that sort of um, Neolithic site, that you've, yes. got, you've got the buildings are very much like this. Yes. Uh, but they're not, they're not as advanced as this. I'll, I'll, you know, but, but the way, the way uh, Chatelhoyuk works is that the streets are above the houses and they were actually getting to the houses from above. Um, yeah. And you can not only say that, um, you can not only say that about Chattel Hayek, that's exactly the example I've been using all, all this week, to be honest with you. 
But I would also say you could say similar to some civilizations in Central America and particularly then South America with the Inca, that people would be buried within the house. Yes. Um, or if not, some more special people or less special people were mummified and kept in niches. And guess what this site has? It's got little niches that we don't, only, that we don't understand in strange places. We've got, right. no, we've got no evidence of mummifying people. But then again, the niches are so, so far above ground level in these buildings that you can't really put much in them unless you're putting somebody in there who's going to actually look over the house on a regular basis. Um, so what we're, if, what we're talking about, uh, again, is that, say, for example, um, I, the archaeologists are accounting the larger kivas um, to represent maybe a family grouping here. Um, and that may be a larger kiva to represent all the peoples on this side. And that larger kiva might represent all the peoples on this side. So if you want an open meeting, due to the hot conditions, you might have an open meeting in the evening in these open courtyard places. In fact, the model that this site follows is a model that you can see with many other civilizations on this planet. Dale, if you do more courses, you know, yeah. you, you might have to take over. Yeah. <laughs> but this is rather important, Dale. Um, whatever you think about archaeology and dendrochronology, I don't, I don't give a fig what anyone says. Dendrochronology is the more accurate dating method of any. Mm. Dendrochronology is an absolute dating method. It's, it's not sort of, oh, radiocarbon dating, the science tells us that this body's um, either um, BC 15 or, or AD 5, you know. Um, when you look at... Um, dendrochronology the dating is precise now Dell, just stare at this a minute and i just want you to tell me one thing see if you can spot it um what does this sample of the great tree tell us just spit it out look at um, the rings. i'm looking at the rings yeah they're quite narrow towards the outer edge Bingo, that's it. You've spotted it. So what we're talking about, um, this, that, would, that, that would probably represent about 850. And then that would represent probably about 950. And that would represent about um, 1050. And that would start to represent about 1150. And I, actually, as it starts to get into um, the 1250s, and the um, 1350s, the rings get indiscernible. And that's exactly what I was looking for. Because in the early stages, um, all of these here are to do with natural growth. But all the others are at the point of when Pablo Benito is actually occupied. And you can actually start to spot that now there's very little moisture meaning that the tree is not using its full potential to grow. So over the same, so over 300 years, and o um, over 300 years, it's not grown a great deal. But over this period of time, I haven't counted the rings. This is probably about 200 years growth. So if this tree was able to grow, it would probably, if, if I can guesstimate, it would probably be something like that. But because of human interference, humanity um, has stopped this tree growing up to a point that at some point the tree died because there was no moisture in the valley. I tell you what, Dal, it would be great if I had something like this for every archaeological site. Because I tell you what, dating things would be so easy. Yes. Now, what, what we've got, we've got these, these beakers. Um, these are actually mono, monochrome design beakers. Um, and if you, if you look at these, you can start to think, well, actually, um, the designs here on the reconstructed designs are very similar to designs that you would see with the Inca culture, 
very similar to designs that you might see with a Minoan culture. In fact, um, these designs that you can actually see um, are very much um, um, determinate um, lines of history. And when we say determinate lines of history, in other words, wherever you're going on the planet, people start designing things like this. You know, it's nothing, nothing unusual. It's just these are the designs that they start using. Um, and the pottery is, again, very similar to other cultures. And it's, you know, there's no, okay, um, aliens dropping down on the planet telling people to make pottery. But that aside, people think this is the way we're going to make pottery com in complete independence to other civilizations hundreds, if not thousands of miles away. And I, I tell you what, Del, right? Um, I'm going off topic. You know, when we're teaching this online, right? Um, is, is, the, is the content a lot more than if it would be in person? Yes. I knew you were going to say that. Because this, this is... Yeah, this is, there's less disruption. Yes, there is less disruption. We don't have... It's more Ant, focused. Exactly. We don't have Anne talking about a washing machine and, and Glenda talking about aliens. <laughs> but anyway, let's get more focused. So um, back, to, back to here. Um, this is what's collapsed in 1941. Um, and before our 1941, this wall was still standing. And this was actually the best preserved bit of wall. But unfortunately, um, this did its worst. Um, we've actually got some images of this part of the wall. Um, which, were, which is taken, I think, in the 1920s. But as you start to look down, you start to look at this very rough landscape. Um, and naturally what's happened is the, the, the earth that's being farmed around this landscape is all ending up in the river. Um, and it's clogging up the river system, which, which, which is a bit of... Um, which it means that it's, it's making the landscape very infertile. And at one point, that's where the great tree um, once stood. Now, you could argue that um, one or two of these kivas could actually be for storing grain or maybe used for liquid. But I've already stated um, that they actually have little um, stone seating platforms in them. I don't know if you can make that out. This is sort of a little bit of a raised seating platform that we're going to actually look at. But if we want to talk about hierarchy, there's one thing clear that I know about hierarchy because I did a master's degree in it. And what I, what I know about hierarchy is it's, it's not just about the people. It's how you build. Because the only way to access into these buildings is actually from above. Um, and if you want to get into these here, you've got to go in from above as well. So if anyone wanted to say, actually, you're not coming into this meeting today, you can't get in. You can't even look in. You can't even hear. That's got a sense of control. This whole complex has got a sense of control about it. Um, and it's got a sense of, um, it's, it's got a sense of enclosement. Um, claustrophobia. However, um, when somebody said to me today, they said, oh, um, these rooms give a sense of claustrophobia. How would somebody know what claustrophobia was like if they lived here all their lives and their family have lived here all their lives um, for nearly 300 years, you know? So, and that is a book about Pablo Benito published before 1941. And how can we tell? There it is. The cliff is still intact, but the rest of this is a bit of a reconstruction. And it's again, it's that archaeological mind ilk that you reconstruct the landscape to what it looks like today and not what it may have looked like in the past. Maybe there were still a few more trees around it in about um, the 1100s until they cut them all down. Now, scratch and sniff. Dale, you've got one choice and you've got to point it out. If these, for example, hang on a minute, if that's a doorway, what are these? 
Oh, are they post holes? Um, um, pat logs. What they are, scaffolding poles you're looking for, yeah? Yeah. Bingo. They're not beam slots, they're for, for scaffolding. So what, what's basically happening is, what's happening is we've got um, them building up to this level and they put scaffolding in um, and then they're building up to this level in and they put scaffolding in. They're up to this level and they're putting scaffolding in and technically there should be scaffolding up here. But what's then happening is as, they're, um, as they've got to the roof level, what they then do is render the walls um, and they remove the, they cut out the posts um, and they then in these, they start to put um, putt or render uh, mortar, which gives the name for it putt log because there's a log there and you're putting it putt log, you're skimming it over. And this is exactly what these are. The typical way of building when you're looking at a castle in medieval Britain. You'll see these are not for beams. Um, uh, they're, they're basically scaffolding putt logs. And you can actually see all the way through to the outside. A little bit more about that a little bit later. Um, and what is rather interesting and what is sad in lots of ways uh, is this little line down here. When they're excavating here in the 1920s, 1927, after they got rid of the idiot that was excavating there, selling off all the artifacts, um, and he died in 1910, then the National, Ge National Geographic Society start excavating there, which is a good idea. However, when they've removed the, the thousands of tons of rubble, and windblown sand, it um, destabilizes the walls. And they start to have walls collapsing. So they've got to start reconstructing some of it. Um, and and the, one thing, the one thing about Pablo Benito is looking at some of the earlier images before the archeologists have interfered with uh, what's there. But before we actually get there, uh, we know that they're actually grinding, um, they're grinding some, um, probably be maize or something like this. Um, and, but this, this here, um, some archaeologists have coined this room as the room of the gamblers, because they believe that this is not just a grinding stone, because there's a hole in it. Um, and they believe that they were using this to gamble with, and that they would fling something in and it would be the one who'd get something in the middle. I think this is archeolo good archaeological imagination in some ways. But these walls would have been rendered. Um, and being rendered walls from the inside and the outside, that meant that for a long period of time, the walls could um, keep um, the erosion elements away from the beds and, start, um, and stop any major dis destruction. Um, and again, there we go. So this is probably more familiar for the likes of Pat. Um, but the main, the two main, um, the, the, the two main sites, the ones that you all have heard of, are Chaco Canyon, Pablo Benito, are Mesa Verde, that cliffside um, site that we saw. But there's also Pueblos and cliffside buildings in Canyon de Shelley, and also another one known as Aztec, nothing to do with the Aztec people. Uh, but there's lots of other places within this landscape, all also in Utah, other places in Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, that we've got these places for the people, the Pueblo Benitos and the cliffside um, villages and towns like the one at Mesa Verde that we'll look at in the near future in the heart of the good old United States of America. Now, Dell, you've got some thinking outside the box now. Um, and the thinking outside the box 
is if I can zoom out a little bit. What does that terracotta face tell you? And, and there's an important bit of evidence that we don't find with something that we call um, people who lived in Scotland. You know when we call the Picts Picts? Why mm. are they called the Picts? Don't know. Because the Romans said that they had that they had tattoos on their faces. But what do we see in Pictish art? We don't see a single representation of any Pict having any tattoos on them. So the Romans may not have got the description of the Picts correct. But there's the, so in, in turn, what is the evidence I'm looking for on this face? Tattoos. Bingo! Even though we don't get the remains of the people <clears throat> with us today, um, what is rather interesting is that women uh, from this terracotta object is portraying women not only had um, ear studs, but they also had tattoos. Um, and and you could, you, somebody could argue, they could say, hang on, this is terracotta. How do you know that people actually lived like this or, or looked like this? And the answer is, can you honestly give me a photograph and tell me a million percent that that photograph hasn't been changed or doctored? Can you, can you honestly tell me that that is a real impression of what you look like? The answer is you can't. And the answer is you can't really know. But I believe from this little bit of evidence that these, the women in the society were tattooed, which, it, which could be very similar to tattooed women in Africa today. It's not dissimilar to the Maori tattoos, are you there? Actually, it does look like a Maori face, doesn't it? It does look like a Maori face, but the difference is the nose, probably. Um, yeah. um, Maori's like me, we've got very big noses. Um, and, but yeah, not dissimilar at all, exactly. So can, I, can we just, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, go to that image. Um, before we have the break, but one thing we're gonna have a little we're gonna have a little look at this, right? So um, let's um, let's change my colour um, to here. So these we've agreed are kivas. Don't agree with me that they're community centres, but that's what we're calling them. Most of them anyway. Um, and rather interestingly enough, the reason why we don't believe that their people are living in them because there are no fires in fire fire halves in them like these structures there's evidence of halves in these structures these are the square structures looking on this plan you can't find any evidence of any halves being in the kivas so that means that they're not for habitation because nobody's cooking in them for example because you need a half to cook surely well uh, maybe argue not if you've got a pot noodle. But the, but the, the point is, there's ra something rather interesting. If you've got halves on the lowest levels of these buildings, and there's no windows, and they're four stories high, where did the smoke go to? And maybe we might answer that after the break. Um, also, it's, also, it's indicating as well that we've got areas of storage okay we've got um other areas um other areas of storage as well um and uh, oh actually, hang on, got that wrong those are areas of ovens and the areas of um um of storage are these ones um and there's another storage one um there's another oven there in very similar places, but the fact of the matter is, it makes the functioning of this um, Pablo Benito very, very interesting. And um, Dell, if you want to get a bit sort of um, ley line-ish, right? Um, can you spot that I've just suddenly spotted? If you look at North being there. The oh yes, aligned. Yeah. Bingo. But I'm it's not aligned. gonna. Yeah, exactly. But the wonderful thing is the geometry of these the circles in there and, and the linear line is actually mm -hmm. so wonderful. Um, 
and and down in some of these um and i'll just chuck this in there because we'll see it after the break in some of these buildings you can have a doorway and you can see from this room all the way through through the doorways all the way to the other side if through every single room is they're perfectly aligned which takes architectural skills far greater than some medieval mm. peoples of, of a similar time span and you could tell Dell, i'm loving the drawing um yes this is a this is a reconstructed wall this is a reconstructed wall near to where some of the wall had actually collapsed um i don't spend much on this one because as they reconstructed it they they haven't made account of some of the walls rising as the walls risen over here but again giving you a sort of a little bit of an overview what's of interest here um in the non-reconstructed part is this doorway goes directly outside when you're talking about access analysis and control if you wanted to control people why are you allowing them to go directly outside why don't you have the wall around them and keep everybody in and watch as they go on out in and out it's, it's not a theme, it's not a male mindset that's built this it's a mindset that thinks differently that thinks opposed to defense this is what we're talking about and i'm loving the birds singing in the background what we're going to do oh, in my garden through the window oh we love it we love it and at one point there would have been birds singing within this landscape in amongst all those mm. trees and i'm looking at that and i'm thinking that is like one of the ships of the desert um you know it, it's it's poetic um you're looking at that and it's almost it's almost as if indiana jones-ish you know and i think indiana in, in indiana jones in um i think i think this type of landscape is revisited in the last last crusade i'm not sure but um it, it's sort of indiana jones -ish. it's really interesting but what is in this landscape is very barren bush and somebody said to me they said oh all right then if these people didn't have any trees why didn't they plant trees well the land wasn't fertile left for them to plant any more trees these rv um their civilization um had collapsed and the last thing you're going to want to do is, is plant trees or try to plant trees um and wait for a few decades so what we're going to do we're going to um, show you what the next image is going to be um, we're going to take a break so um, i'm going to ask if there's any questions um, again rule with the cameras and stuff so anyone want to say anything whilst i unmute you all no fine um, the only thing i wanted to say is that pine leaves are usually called pine needles yeah <laughs> No, actually, actually um, you are dead right. Um, <laughs> however, in my little book behind me, you can refer to them as pine leaves as well. <laughs> okay. but, but no, you are right. They are called pine needles as well. We're both right, so that's fine. I love it when two people are right. How can you have an argument over that? <laughs> oh, come on, let's, let's just have one. Um, if it was John on, in the Skype class, he would argue over that one. Um, <laughs> are, are there any other questions or are we going to have a break? No. Something I read, and it, I mean, I said there were so many. I made so many different things with different conclusions. But one of the things was that there weren't too many people living there because they didn't find all that much waste that they would have expected for so many people living there. And there was this idea that there were they had people living in sort of pots and things round about who were doing the building, and. Um, and there was this elite lot that lived there, with, that are buried there, and uh, and people kept, they thought they were they, it was a, uh, that people came from all around the area and came to it to uh, collect together. Right, okay, okay. So, um, you said a lot there. Um, there are lots of other, um, there are lots of other sites like Pablo Benito, so the last one I wouldn't agree with. The other thing as well is, um, the evidence that you're looking for in in the form of human waste and yeah. rubbish i yeah. answer after the break and it's quite right. a, it's quite a simple formula okay. if you run out of fuel there's something that you can burn yes. Yes. 
Um, and the other thing as well is um, very, very good theories that you've, you've, you've found there. But the problem is with a site like this, needing a number of people to look after it, in effect, you've got entrances leading directly outside. Why would the elite want exits and entrances all over the place? You're surely going to control it. Um, and I wouldn't be for that either. Um, and it's good for you to do your research. And um, it's good to have another point of view. But um, we will talk about the, the refuge and rubbish uh, after the break. And the other thing as well is, the one thing the archaeologists have been doing since the 2000s is excavating in other areas. And they've been finding more evidence for the evidence that you're talking was absent. Because archaeologists are focused on the main structures. They haven't found the other evidence. And now we're finding the other, other evidence. And those 300,000 artifacts are coming from that later work, not the earlier work. Yeah. Right, let's have a break. Another thing. Okay. Another one, quickly, quickly, go. An another thing um, I read. Oh, God, I've forgotten it. <laughs> oh, oh, you're, you've just done an Anne. Right, let's take a break. <laughs> take a break. He looks puzzled. Oh, Anne's gone. Oh. Um, it's a very, very. With trying to get a satellite map. Perhaps. Oh boy, give me some maps. Oh boy. Okay. Last right? The last take. Which grants is? A couple of visitor is above grants. Okay. Okay. Cuba is off to the right. Go back in there again. Eh, 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 eh. Come on. Come Cuba. Come on, Cuba. Oh. Where's Grants? Is that a minute ago? Come on, where are you? Coyote? No, 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 no. Maybe. Come on. Play ball, Grants. There you are. So, you're north of there. Where are you? So there. Come on. Go up from grants, straight up. All right, go back. Go back to grants. Mm. 
You will look like American silos. <laughs> Cubes are One seven nine, okay. White horse, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay.
Do you know what? It, it, I, I miss all the chitter chatter of um, of the classes. Dorothy in the kitchen uh, with her crude jokes. <laughs> um, Pat having to be woken up because she's been asleep for the past hour. Um, <laughs> Only ten minutes. <laughs> but Bill, Bill, Bill moaning about something. Um, I thought you've overcharged him. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I've overcharged him. Yeah, yeah. Are you meeting with him now, aren't you? Uh, yeah, but he, he's um, he's now in the um, the Tuesday evening Skype class. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're they're rather elite in the Tuesday evening Skype class. They've got all the, ones, you know, they've got all the the ones who feel that they're very special, Ooh. like like um, like like like, like uh -huh. Peter from Barry, and there's um, Filthy Rog from Cardiff. Dodgy Andy from Arnside. Oh, and, and then there's the token woman, uh, Margaret. She's a bit, she's a bit of a one. And there's, there's Filthy John from Newport. And mm -hmm. then there, there's, there's Dirty Bill. That's his new name from um, Pregend. <laughs> We're not special, huh? <laughs> no, they're, no, they're just special needs. <laughs> you're, you're just special. <laughs> 
Now, now, but Anne. Anne, is she there? All oh, right. Okay, I'm here. Oh. She's in the garden, ringing something out. <laughs> 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 she, she might be bringing her husband. <laughs> oh, God. There so, she is. Henry, are you up to keep me company for the next um, 30, 40 minutes? Uh, yeah, I'll give it a go. Oh, hold on. Oh, 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 then, oh, then again, I could pick on Drina. You could. Um, and should I pick on Drina? Oh, I think you should. Gal, should we pick on Drina today? Why not? Yeah, yeah. good it's plan. Not any different. Exactly, exactly. Well, before before we start, before we start, right, because, because Drina's very different. It's her glasses that does it. Um, so what was I going to say? Right, not, not forgetting to remind you all that, um, obviously, you have your normal call on Monday. Those that I'll be seeing on Saturday online. And by the way, on, when, on the, the Saturday ones online, we'll start to look at other places, um, like Edinburgh, um, and the Pendle Witches, and all sorts of strange things. Um, Anne will be definitely into the Pendle Witches, because she's probably related to them. Um, <laughs> and um, and obviously, obviously, next Thursday, we'll be, where we'll be doing the Archaeology of the English Armada. Uh, so there you go. You know, a bit, a bit of it. What's that? Is that next week? The the archaeology of the English Armada. Yes. Next week. Yeah. Yeah. Now the English Armada is the epitome of, of a one-sided history where everyone's heard of the Spanish Armada, but nobody hears about the Armada in the next year that was practically completely sunk to every single ship. It had a worse fate than um, it had a worse fate than the Spanish Armada. So um. Can I ask why we've got eight participants and two of them are called Anne Lowe? <laughs> oh no, I can't handle two of them. No way. <laughs> One's enough. <laughs> right, so, um, oh God, I, I've, I've lost the plot. I've lost the plot. And those, <laughs> those that want to join our Wednesday, uh, Wednesday forum, uh, which uh, I know Pat fell asleep this week when she was supposed to be joining us at the forum on Wednesday. Um, but, uh, that's usually that that this week next week is going to be between one and two because uh, Pete will be given a minute miniature ch talk about washing machines through the ages <laughs> um, and, 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 um, and there'll be another talk the following week ring pulls from through the ages <laughs> Two of them about there, there's a few of them about yeah. <laughs> Anyway, let's get started. Right, so I'm going to... Well, you haven't even missed me, have you? <laughs> oh, fuck it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally, 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 totally excluded. Totally Hang totally on. And we, we, there's two of you on the screen, which is really frightening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, oh. there's there's three hands here today. I, but my computer one. just down, it just went yeah. off. Yeah, yeah, no, well, you, yeah, well, I'm, you're being off now. Right, anyway, I'm going to cut the mics now. It's just going to be me and Drina on, on our loving moment. Oh, God. Right, so, so here we go. Um, and let's go to screen share. Uh, where are, oh, God, I've got to find the blooming lecture a minute. There we go. Um, Right, what are you seeing on your screen, Drina? It's just me and you. It's just loading now. Oh, oh right. I've got I an overview. I, I tell you what, the it, what is it like just being with me today? Oh, it's just wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I know, I know. It's, it's my, don't, tell, <laughs> don't tell Margaret. Uh, okay. <laughs> she gets very possessive. Um, <laughs> Do you know, do you know before the, do you, for, do you know before the break, so try and get me into this, right? Um, it's just, it's just the idea that we've got, um, we've got a civilization on its, on, on the edge of collapse. They've got no fuel, um, but there's a perfectly useful fuel that they could use. And it's been proven throughout history by, by, by burning 
um, excrement from animals and human beings um, is a perfect substitute um, for fuel. Um, and it, it's something that I used to talk about um, in connection with prehistoric populations. Um, and it's, it's done today in Africa where, where, you know, waste from animals and human beings, waste from mammals is actually used for fuel. Um, it would burn at a higher temperature than peat, for example. Um, and there would naturally be a lot of it because all animals and human beings need to go to the toilet. And the easiest thing is in a dry desert like this, all you need to do is, is lay it out on the surface. And then in the, um, after the heat of the day, you collect it together in a basket and burn it. So that, that sort of answers um, what a couple of the questions that uh, have been asked about, um, you know, middens and evidence for these people. But, but lo and behold, most of the focus has actually been on the big structure at Pablo Benito. Um, and, you know, I'm discounting what Anne said earlier on that, you know, these were major trading uh, locations. But the fact of the matter is there was a number of them. Um, and it goes into the old adage uh, that somebody, somebody's going to have to live here. Somebody's going to have to look after it. And why not the people who are actually here in the first place? Having large trading tech, trading links actually brings in another subject of warfare. If you sort of keep yourselves to yourselves within this landscape, then things are fine. Um, so what we, what we obviously need to do is get my little bar on the screen again so I can scribble. Because as you can appreciate, Gina, I'm really liking drawing now. Um, so one thing that we can see about these kivas, if people are saying that they were used for storage pits, then you look at ones like this, you get benches in them. So it then comes back into the idea that these are community um, centers or community areas. Um, and to be honest with you, for the life of me, where they're getting the population numbers from, I don't know. The other point is if small numbers of people living here, it would soon be a site that would be um, start to decay rapidly. So it's probably a, a place that's lived in by not thousands of people, but a maximum of say a thousand people in total. And each of these groups of people, each of these families is gonna need some kind of communal space. Um, we all see what it's like being shacked up at home with our family and nowhere to go while, uh, these these had this type of setup, but they had this community room as well. So this photograph is from 1929 from the cliff that is now collapsed. Um, and clearing all the drawing stuff, and here we go. Now, what is amazing about this? There's lots of things that are actually amazing about this. One is that it shows two sets of beams. Um, this, is go, this is going to be classed as an eave wall, um, you know, the long lengths of walls on a house. And this is going to be classed as a gable wall. So from gable to gable, from one end of the house um, to the other end of the house, this, is, this, is, this runs from the pointy bit of the house, that's what we're saying, but in this case, uh, the flat roof. So the thinner bits of wood go from gable to gable. And the strength of the wall on the side, the eave walls themselves, um, the length of the wall itself, you put these huge beams in between. Um, and these huge beams were, were really huge beams indeed, um, because these are the beams of the Ponderosa pine as they stretch across. I could do quite a good reconstruction there. Um, and then the other ones, these, would go this way. And in other words, this would support the flooring. And you've obviously still got evidence of that. Now, the bigger timbers um, between the two eave walls um, are quite chunky timbers. And these are obviously from the early stages of them building at Pueblo Bonito. Um, what is also interesting is these little niches. And I mentioned these niches before. I mentioned the niches in passing earlier on. Um, Drina, and, Drina, you and I are not tall people, right? I'm five foot seven, and what are you, five foot four? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> right, so I don't think we're going to be able to reach that. So no. that there is no. not going to be very practical. So I'm thinking that you're going to put something in there that isn't going to be everyday touched and used. And I'm, if, I, if I want to go and think about how the Inca, thousands of miles south, are treating their loved ones, they mummify their loved ones, 
and that may be one location where one of their loved ones is um, sat. And then the other loved ones, people of other status, are being buried underneath the floor. So that would sort of make sense. But what makes more sense than even imagining anything at all um, is looking at um, the symmetry of these. You've got one doorway, you've got two doorways, you've got three doorways, and you've got four doorways, and they are all equally aligned. You can look right down them. And that's somebody who means business when they're building. What is also important is in this very lowest layer, um, what you do find is actually some evidence of the mortar adhering still to the walls. Um, and with the mortar still adhering to the walls, this tells you that they not only had these walls um, and they were mortared together, but there was a render inside. And this may have been highly decorated, but we don't really know much more uh, than that. Um, so obviously this is the first, um, this is the ground floor. But if we're talking American, this is the first floor because the Americans do it differently. And, and obviously um, you, you've got thresholds all the way through as well. You've got that one threshold there. You've got another threshold there, um, another threshold there. Obviously stone lintels with all of these are all really well aligned and everything is very much load bearing. One of the last images today is an archaeological, is, is an architectural innovation that blew my mind, has, has blown a few other people's minds when I've shown them it. So we're not going to go there yet. So clear all that. Thank you. And go back to the map. Paul. Yeah, go for it. The last, the last door, is that outside or no, part uh, of a building? No, no. If we, if we go to, um, if we go. That last door. Yeah, if we. If you go to here, for example, um, say, for example, we're going down what we've just done. We go down there. Yeah. We keep going. Yeah. And you keep going. It just... And it keeps going. And it keeps going. And actually, the doorways actually come in from this direction. Right. Now, I was just wondering if it would create a draft. Now, that... If it went right from one side or another. That is one interesting thing that I've mentioned. You can't really have fires without a draft. Otherwise, it gets no. too smoky. Now, um, it's not showing that all of these rooms have actually got fires because if you actually look back at the plan, it's only showing you evidence of some of the rooms having fires. Now, yeah. this doesn't mean to say it's um, categorical evidence. Um, and some rooms in the lower levels may have been used for something else. But there's a sense of draft, and that's the other thing, that you're getting air coming in from the doorways from outside. Yeah. The other thing is, well, if you, you can't really have a window here because you've got um, another wall here. So the windows yeah. don't work, so you've got, to, you've got to basically have the doorways. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, moving on. Now, what is unusual about this um, is there's technological innovation, which is this bowl, uh, which might be very similar to anything that you might find in the Mediterranean from ancient Greece, but this is a little bit more basic. You've got the turquoise beads that we've just been mentioning. You've got the buildings that we've just been seeing. But look at this, they're still using obsidian arrows. Now, it's a very strange this. It's, a, it's almost as if you've got Roman civilization, but they're still using um, flint arrows to fight with. Um, and you're thinking that wouldn't work. But then again, where are the rules? The problem is with this civilization, we don't really have the iron. Um, we've got copper, we've got gold, we've got silver, we've got all those, those other types of metals. But we don't have iron. Um, so what they are using, they're still using obsidian. And obsidian is used from all the cultures, all the way across the Americas. This is the hard material. And obsidian itself, alongside flint, is used in some delicate eye operations today. That tells you how good obsidian is and how flint is. Um, so if you ever got an eye operation, just ask what they're using, because they won't be using iron. My, you know, what I'm trying to say there is that um, you know, even though it seemed to be a backwards material, we're still using it today. Um, so that's the point I'm trying to make. Again, now this itself, when I asked somebody in the Lancet Major class today, 
I said, doesn't this look good? And the first thing they said, I feel claustrophobic. Now, what do you feel when you look at this? This is in, this is in the top of the building, right? Um, so this is a floor um, above many other floors. How does that make you feel? It's not that bad. I would live it's got in it. Quite relatively a high ceiling, hasn't it? So it's just dark. To be honest with you, they had lanterns and, you know, we don't know, but then there's may have been another reason why they burned other material other than, um, other than timber in the later stages. If you're burning, um, if you're burning fecal matter, it burns at a lower temperature. So it doesn't have the same yield that it could sort of instantly combust and set light to wood. So there are, there are advantages, but you would have, you would have had the base itself laid with lined with clay anyway, or something else like that. So, um, but these types of things um, in other descriptions, they're seen as vaults or, or storage um, or storage areas. But again, you can see the really hefty beams, which would not be available in the later period. And you can get an idea how they're building. And this ladder is based on evidence from Mesa Verde rather than Pueblo Benito itself. Now, what I loved about this illustration is, um, what I loved about this illustration is what I can actually tell you about it rather than what I can't tell you about it. Right, that over there is where the original river ran through the canyon, basically dry today. Well, it would be when this is being taken. Um, if you look, there's a doorway, 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 um, blocked up doorway, another doorway. You've got all these doorways leading directly inside the building. So this is not for defense. But what does dominate is actually these massive kivas inside. And the other smaller ones don't seem to dominate as much. But you can get an idea of the height of the wall. It's still quite substantial. And what's happened is that when this wall um, collapsed um, in um, 1941, this sort of area, they've sort of reconstructed. But moreover, this is, this is more likely to be the original wall to over about um, 15 meters in height. They're saying that the, the height of these walls was up to 30 meters, which is, which is a hell of a lot more again. Um, and they're getting that evidence from, from the archaeology that they're excavating. The downside is them excavating, removing all the soil, is that um, they're having to support um, some of these buildings uh, with iron support such as this one, which is a bit of a shame. But then again, you can't have everything in archaeology when you want to learn things. Oh. Yeah? I, I can't help. It keeps going through my mind. It reminds me of Roman baths or central heating systems. I mean, if it was so, if it was so high, you know, 30 metres or 30 feet. Um, 30 metres. You know, you this is like dwarfed, would be dwarfed by <coughs> high walls. And it makes you wonder if perhaps there was some sort of, you know, maybe the temperature was different then. I, I don't know. The, they used all the trees burning them. Well, well, interesting enough, there's nothing in my notes about anything to do with water at all. No, <laughs> all, the, no, all the archaeologists want to stay away from it. But what you're talking about is that the wall level is basically where that orange line is. It's, it's at, so what you're talking about is something like this. Yeah. Massively high. Yeah. Uh, these are, and, and these people knew how to build. It's almost as if it's like a Colosseum like structure. It's absolutely huge. It's, 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 it, you know, it, this thing would be seen for miles around and, but they're not defensive walls. Um, the, other, the other thing as well is what we are finding um, is that from another image that we actually do see is that these things here, if you can actually see little black things, these are actually, the, the timbers actually jettison through the wall and some of these other ones are actually putt logs. They're not actually, um, they're not actually doorways, but some of the other doorways do actually open directly outside on another level which does actually make you think that there's a lot more to this than we actually, than actually meets the eye. And by the way, Anne, you're, you're, you're supposed to have your mic off, but then again, as you be very sensible 
Um, make sure you allow Drina to talk first. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. Because Drina is very special to me. Because <laughs> uh, I remember the last time I gave her a hug, it was a moment I will forget. No, I, I won't forget. Um, I will forget. <laughs> so so um, as, we can, as we can see, um, and I hope the, the cursor line, hang on, right, there we go. Look at that there. Look at those big, thick timbers. Um, you know, and they're still in the wall there. Obviously, um, the, the, the rest of it's actually decayed, but these are the other timbers that are coming across. And don't be, mist don't be hoodwinked by the fact that there's light coming through that doorway there, because there would have been another level above, above that in the other room. So uh, there's different doorways at different angles, but the, the key alignment on what I showed you before is, is, is architecturally brilliant and a nice grinding stone in front of us as well. Um, moving on. I tell you what, right, that is spectacular. Um, what archaeology has lost since that collapse um, is we have lost. Um, lots of this, all of this has been lost since the 1940s due to that collapse. And it's very likely, no, I don't think, it, it's, it's quite likely, the if the archaeologists didn't start excavating here, the cliff may not have collapsed. What I'm trying to sort about, what I'm trying to get at is that any movement in, in the ground may have caused um, the cliff to collapse, but that's sort of talking out of the box. But this this guy here, um, this guy being um, quite a tall chap. So if we want to sort of get an idea of the scale of this part of the wall. So we're saying that this guy is two meters. So another two meters. So we've got another two meters. So we've got another two meters. And we've got another two meters. So this section is two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, twelve 10, 11, 12 meters in height. Um, and this is much higher over on this side. And the, the point, the point, the other point that you can actually see here uh, is twofold. Um, the low levels of the lintels inside the um, external um, access um, into these, into the rooms. Is this because the ground level um, has been raised since, or it would make good sense um, if you're going to be having any level of burning inside, um, if it acts very similar to something like a roundhouse, um, that you have a lower lintel for the access of people coming inside the building. Um, and obviously what I've just mentioned earlier on is these are actually the timber beams um, showing on the outside of the building, very similar to any of those um, structures that you see from um, the Spanish period after the 1500s, 1600s. Move, but this really nice image, I, lo I lo like looking at this one, so it's big from the, about the 1920s. Um, so, now this is a very special bird. This is one of the Macau's um, one, of, one of the sets of remains of one of the Macau's found associated with the site. And why this is rather interesting to me is it tells me one thing, that they revered these birds because, look at, look at the bones, the, the bod when, you, when you're going to eat an animal, the usual thing you're going to do is cut the head off straight away, right? That's not happened with this bird. Um, and these birds would have been, um, would have been living along living within that large ponderosa pine and other wooded landscape that once existed. And as the trees started to cut down, they got rarer and rarer and rarer. rarer. And it basically came to the point that they basically said, well, we've got to revere these birds. And you find these mixed in with the archaeological evidence excavated at the site. And, and I've just noticed this, that when you look at that there, in this, in this midden that they're excavating, there's lots of bits of organic material, lots of strands, uh, which, which to be honest, we would love to know what that was. This is, the, these, these are, these, um, this is a photograph from the excavations from the 1920s. 
So they would not have analysed everything that we're actually seeing in the side section of that trench, which is a bit of a shame. There might be something out there. Um, and the reason why I'm putting a Spanish um, church into this is it goes to show that this Spanish church is not um, two, three stories high. It's, it's basically um, ground floor level. Um, and this is starting to get a bit rackety roundy. It's after 400 years. So it, may, it goes to show that um, our people um, at um, Pablo Benito, six, 700 years before the Spanish get there, had these wonderful engineering skills. Um, and the wonderful engineering skills were superior to this structure in one key way. In our buildings at Pablo Benito, they didn't need the circular arch. And that is answered towards the end of the lecture. And why that is an amazing architectural innovation. And they did it in a different way. Um, and when we, when we think, just, just one point to be said about this, because you've got this bit of a curved wall and they're somehow able to, um, the geometry is great, is, is so wonderful. And the point I'm trying to get at is if you, if you go to, say for example, you've got the curvature of that outside, you've got the curvature of that, you've got the curvature of that, you've got the curvature of that. And alongside that again, you've got these walls connecting them together all the way through it in different areas. And that is a certain level of skill to be able to do that. <clears throat> That's not done by people who don't know what they're doing because they did know what they were doing. And to get the height of the walls that they managed to reach, that is very special indeed. So um, if anyone wants to get an idea of where we're going, this is, um, this is north, this way. So, um, so that's never eat, this is east shredded wheat. So that's a good old west and this is a north, this is looking northwards. Mouse again. And this is that building that we saw a little while ago. Um, and there's something else going on in, in this building. And what is going on in this building is simply up here. That's what's going on. And what is going on is that um, at one stage, um, if we want to do a little bit of art here, um, what's going on is we've got these, these um, beams going across here. And that's fine. Um, and that's fine. It's almost like I'm doing a bit of a time team now, isn't it? That's the floor level. It looks really good. Everything's working fine in there. Um, and then what happens is as they start to run out of timber, they actually have a corbelling effect where it's actually um, set in like a step. So this is what that is by there. Um, so what's happening is that just basically the thinner timbers are just resting on this corbel further up because they, they, they do not have the engineering at that stage in the timber to actually have um, beam slots in the upper floor. And then that goes on further to other levels. Um, and again, when we, we mentioned that earlier on, we, we'll move on quickly. There's that. And there is another niche, actually more on the level of um, Druna and myself, but that looks more like a blocked in doorway. Again, that's not a window, that's a doorway. That's a doorway. That's a doorway. And that is a doorway as well. I'm having so much fun doing this. Um, <laughs> so uh, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do this on a live lecture. It'd be impossible. So again, you, again, just quickly looking at this one, you can, again, see the level of linearness that you get. You've sort of got a straight line going down there. Um, and you've got, um, you've got another straight line go going on down there. Another straight line. Look at these, look at the straight lines. That, that, that is perfect levels of building. Absolutely great. Clear as, as you can ever get. Obviously being rendered as well. Uh, there's one downside with what we're looking at now. And what we're looking at is a cache of objects found in the 1920s 
by the National Geographic um, Society. Um, and what is going on here is these are wonderful objects, a mixture of wonderful objects. Great, love them. And these have all been washed. And that's where we come in with the problem. They didn't know, they didn't have the technology back then that actually lots of these showed evidence um, of cocoa residue. Um, and as, as, as Anne knows, her daughter um, um, did a course with uh, Professor Charette at uh, Oxford and he was into his lipid analysis. Now in 2009, they started to do cocoa analysis residue. Um, and they worked out that if they had have had the technology back in the 1920s, they'd been able to work out that these people are trading over 1,200 miles south with the people of the Maya. The, these, were, these were connected with the people of Maya with trade routes, which were over 1,000 miles in length. You know, that, that's, that's, that's a long distance. Um, moving on again. How would they travel? They got llamas and things. Um, inter interesting enough, um, interesting enough, if my brain is working properly, um, some of the last domestic forms of horses were in North America. Um, and it's likely that the, the horse itself that we have in the West evolved in America. So um, we do have types of horses in America and we've obviously got further on down south, we've got the llamas and the alpacas, for example. So we've, we've got that sense of trade link. But these are not the sort of um, Arabic type horses that you actually get in the Hollywood films um, of the plains, um, you know, from the 1960s. So you do, you do have the ability to travel. One thing I actually missed in my notes, Drina, is actually this object. This is actually a flute. Um, in one of the rooms, they've, they excavated, um, um, I think, eight flutes. It's strangely, they, guess what the name of the room was, the name of the room was after they had excavated it? <laughs> the room of the flutes. Yeah, the room of the flutes, there you go, it's great. So, um, so they found eight flutes in there. So, so these were quite musical people as well. Um, and with the absence of objects like this, it doesn't mean to say they were musical, but because they found flutes, they actually knew they were musical. And now you get sort of a little niche neek in there. You know, when, when you're blowing through a flute and you've got that little weird thing, there it is. Um, and again, more of these types of typical pots that are found throughout various technologies on the planet. And there is a Macau, a basically a very large parrot. Um, actually, I'm not sure of the colorations at all because the feathers haven't survived. But these are the revered birds that once existed flying amongst the ponderosa pines back in the day. Um, and they're no longer there today. The, the population is extinct because there's no trees for them to nest in. There's nothing. So they've become extinct. And it's, it's like looking at the skull of a dodo, isn't it? It's quite sad. Um, but they weren't, they, obviously, you know, they weren't mummified and sort of treated in the way the Egyptians treated them. And I, I feel they had quite a bit of a reverence. And, you know, maybe at the beginning, I may have been slightly unfair. Maybe these people towards the end of their civilization at Pueblo Benito, maybe they, they had actually realized um, that what they had done by keeping these birds, by thinking, actually, we once had many of these birds and now we don't. Um, once there were many, then there were few, then there were two, and then there were one. Um, and you get that sense in your mind. Maybe I'm not being fair on these people. Um, maybe there's something that we don't know. There's talk that, um, you know, okay, we can assume that they may have started to plant trees and, and so on, and maybe it was too late and all these other things. Um, and maybe they hung on to a subsistence, subsistence way of life, but eventually it would have been too late. Again, looking from the rock, um, the rock face itself, I'm not really going to zoom in on that one. And look at these wonderful um, turquoise um, objects, semi-precious um, mineral, as described earlier on. They found literally hundreds of thousands of these. I do believe I'm right in what I say. In Nevada and Colorado, they are still mining turquoise in the, the turquoise mine. So any of you go into a little, little shop and they've got these little... Uh, turquoise beads, this is where it's come from. 
next week I'm going to have Pat with me. Um, now, I'm not going to tell you anything, Drina. This is a, a kiva. This is one of those, um, those circular structures. This is a very large one, right? I'm going to tell you what's going on there, and then you're going to give an interpretation, right? Is that fair? Um, I'll give you the information, yeah. right? These are little niches. These niches are about the size of a small window, right? Um, that's an entranceway in there. It's a step-like entranceway. However, um, the idea of a stairwell and stairs is not predominant within this site. There are no real stairs anywhere. And I'm not really sure that that stair is actually, uh, was actually built at the time the people of Pablo Benito were actually there. These here are not hearths. They're referred to as vaults or storage areas. These by some archeologists are referred to as speaking platforms. And that speaks for itself without any interpretation. That's a shelf that you may have actually been able to sit on. This actually could indicate some kind of entrance or exit, which is not familiar with the other kivas. And you've got entrance from the roof um, with very big timbers um, spanning over the whole thing. Quick interpretation from you, and it's probably going to be right. Oh, right. Well, maybe they had ceremonies in the middle and people stood around the outside or sat. I don't know. They would they have precious art artifacts in the square? Places? Now, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, this, this, is, this is what I thought. Well, we'll go with all that. Um, I, I believe that niches act, actually acted the same as people being placed in them that were mummified, you know, yeah. the special people within yeah. the group. Do you, do you know, I know it sounds silly, but um, did you ever see, see that film, um, The Crystal Skull, the last Indiana Jones film? Yes. And, you know, around the outside, there were all these crystal skulls in sort of, was it in little niches or they were around the outside? And yeah, maybe. And so yeah, yeah. the whole thing flew and it turned up into um, an alien spacecraft and went into um, space. <laughs> yeah. I, I, actually, actually, mm -hmm. I, did, I never liked that film because it was just too far fetched. Yeah. Um, and this is why Harrison Ford wants, wants to do another one. But when, when you think about it, it, it does make sense um, that this could be a meeting centre. Um, because in Scotland, we have those buildings known as brochs. And some archaeologists believe yes. that those brocks are actually community centres because around the brocks you get all these little housing, all these little houses. Some archaeologists yeah. say the brocks were actually used for the elite of society. But then again, you know, brocks weren't, wouldn't have been really nice places to live in. So they're thinking that, you know, the brock and mouse, mouse which is about 11 metres still in height. I've actually been there. It's spectacular. Um, and you can think of it being um, more of a meeting centre. And if you interpret these as meeting centers, because it's an open space, you, um, there's no evidence other than in one of the buildings that there was a fire in the middle, um, that would make sense. And there's no other interpretation that I can think of. And if you've got anything else, chuck it in there now before we move on slide. The gap on the floor, the long thing. Yes. Is, is that an exit or an entrance? That could be is anything. a secret one? That, that could be anything. Yeah. Because this is a lot, this is a large, this is a, the, one of the large um, structures. And you know what? When you're doing a lecture like this and you, you're doing a whole building, you don't have time to look in all the nooks and crannies. Um, and that's a bit of a shame because it would be nice to actually have more information about the, what that was. Maybe Anne can do a bit of research on that for next week. The other Anne, not, not, not Anne Bregen, <laughs> but the other Anne. Um, Anne will probably come up with the conclusion that it's a washing machine. Um, <laughs> so, so this is a, one of the other, um, this is one of the other ones there. Um, and it's basically showing something similar. It's got the niches that I've described. It's got the bench that I've described. It's got the, the seating pits that, 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 or, or, or preaching platforms or whatever. Um, and then it's got a single firebox in the middle, right? In this one not in the other one. Um, and the thing is with that firebox, right? You're not gonna really be able to burn much. It's not gonna heat the building, so it's not for heating. No. You may have burned something like incense in the middle and that was it, that, that was it. Obviously incense from the Far East and all the rest of it, but they could have easily burnt something very similar. 
Um, but that's really not going to provide much heat. It's, it's, it's a bit of a red herring for trying to understand what these kivas were. But this is the smaller of the, um, the two big kivas. Let's again move to that. Um, right, here we go. And moving on. Is there anywhere where they could store water? If they're losing the water supply, they'd need to store what they had. Do you, do you know the idea? Well, the problem is if you had water in this vault, these vaults, it, they get very tepid quickly. I, I, I'm just thinking, yeah, I, I'm yeah. just thinking the two put there's two points there, right? Um, sorry to say again, the human excrement, there's no evidence of, um, there's no evidence of sanitation at this site. Um, so yeah. that must have been taken away and dried. And then, as I'm saying, um, other than that, would have a big pile of shit somewhere. So they must have been disposed of <laughs> it somehow. It didn't yeah. hit the river because they the river wouldn't have been able to take it away. So that's where we get, that's where we get the use of it being in fires. And the problem is me proving that all the halves have been excavated in the 1920s. So, and none of it was properly sampled. So we wouldn't be able to prove that one way or the other. Um, and the sense of water, maybe one or two of these kivas were massive cisterns, which were used to yeah. store water. Again, they would get very tepid and very sort of, um, the water would be get very bad quickly. So they must've been able to boil their water. Um, the other thing as well is, is something that we might have missed. Um, when this was the wonderful Ponderosa landscape and the river still flowing, there may have actually been um, natural um, artesian wells um, that the archaeologists haven't found yet. And the other thing okay. as well is for that, big, for that big pine to have actually grown continually associated with this site, maybe that was very tapped into some groundwater that these people tapped into, which are then again would have restricted the numbers of people that could have lived here if there's a restriction on water. But then again, not a massive restriction on numbers of people simply because it's a site that's used over um, 300 years um, all at the same time. So um, you, could act, you could argue that having um, light coming in from the roof would have been able to light this up under, in, 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 underneath. This is, a, this is a small light kiva um, with all these little bigger niches. This is a reconstruction. Um, but again, um, these may have actually held lamps or these people may have liked to have been in a, a dark landscape. Uh, but again, this is very much um, Mesa Verde type rather than our Pueblo Benito type. And actually, actually, Drina, we've actually come to the very last image. And I did say the very last image had something spectacular. And can you be the second person out of my four lectures to tell me um, what the spectacular architectural feature is associated with this part of the um, Pueblo Benito um, town? What is the architectural feature that I'm looking at? Well, I'm not sure, but they've got a doorway on, on a corner. That's that, it. That's that is, it. That is yeah. the arch do, you, do you know how major that is? No, but it would be very difficult to do. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it, it, that would be very difficult to do one, right? You do see this in some later medieval castles, but, but instead of using, an, a, basically, if you, okay, if you, um, if, I, if I can get, um, right, here we go. So if, if, we, if we have an arch there, that would load there. And if we had an arch there, if we've got an arch there, I can't really do a semicircle, but there we go. If we've got an arch there, um, that would load bear the corner. Yeah. But these people were thinking, well, we've got, to, we've got to carry some of the load because if we're able to carry some of the load, we're able to build much taller. So this is, the, this is, level, this is level one. Um, this is level two. This is level three, and there's going to be another level on top of that again. Um, and this is going to carry the weight. This carries all the way to the corner of that building. Ba mm. Basically, the weight goes onto that and dissipates around the side like an arch. And that is an archaeological innovation that you see in some of the greatest cathedrals anywhere in Europe. 
uh, and they, they do use the flat arch as well in some of those cathedrals. In other cathedrals, they use a sort of domed arch, but that is very important. And this, this innovation is very difficult to do. And you would definitely need a plumb bob and an understanding of geometry to be able to do this in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, just, just a couple of quick things before we, we end today. Um, these, these are those round timbers of the full um, Ponderosa pines that would have been load bearing as well because they're on the lowest level. Um, if you use a whole timber, it's got its strength. If you cut a timber in half, um, like these, it loses its strength. But if you don't have much timber, you will have to um, split your timbers, but they can be used in an upper level because they're not load bearing. And then simply, then what you have, you have beams going across. Um, I, I'm trying to get the angle. Unfortunately, we've got a bit of an odd angle here. You've got beams going across here and that would have carried the floor level um, on the upper level in this building. Um, so on that note, uh, one final point, um, what they're doing is they're narrowing their doorways uh, because this here was down on that level. When I say narrow, narrow them, they, they've lowered the threshold of these, the, these doorways. Probably, probably, for, um, ec um, probably for temperature um, reasons, um, for humidity reasons or whatever you want to call it, they lowered some of the doorways in these buildings. On that note, Drina, is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish? No, I don't think so. Thank you. Right. So what we're going to do, uh, usual rules with where we are now. Um, if, you do, if your face doesn't want to be seen, put off your camera. So what we're going to do, we're going to mute everybody. And, I, and I've got to be honest with you, Anne, that was a good interruption earlier on. Thank you very much. Um, I can say good things about you occasionally, Anne. So everybody, why have I muted everybody? I've got to unmute everybody. Right, so you go. Right, um, now, Anne in Arnside, anything you would like to say? Uh, yes. Um, one of the things I found was, made, well, or shall we say, it sort of illustrated the way knowledge is gained, I think, because these people were so clever with astronomy, maths, and uh, and um, building and that, and yet they didn't know much about ecology or protection of the land, did they? It was a different different kind of science mm -hmm. that one of and nothing about the other. I thought that was really it illustrated that. I think this lecture. Well, it doesn't mean to say they didn't have anything about the other, but you can actually say that that's Western uh, Western society explained in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is us today. Yes, it is, absolutely. We've le not learned any more from it, have we? No, we haven't. No, we haven't. You, you, you know, you could have said that as a statement easy today. Del. Yeah. Fine. I enjoyed that. That was really good. It, it's very exhausting, but that was really good. Um, what, yeah. about, what about Anne? Um, Anne, what about you? Yes, it was, it was, it's certainly very interesting. I, I didn't... Uh, it, you know, I didn't know about that one, I don't think. And uh, worth, you know, keeping your eye open for a bit more information. Um, and what about you, Henry? Oh, I thought that actually this was really informative. It's an area I've not actually come across before. So um, I've learned an awful lot there and there's a lot more to learn. Yeah. There, is a, there is a lot more to learn. This is why we're going to come back and visit Mesa Verde again. Um, and I haven't asked Pat the obvious question. She is from the United States, and I know she's got friends in Colorado and New Mexico. Have you been to any of these sites, Pat? And the answer is going to be yes or no. Yes. <laughs> but only to Mesa Verde. I've never even heard of this place. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, when we do Mesa Verde, I don't want you to say any more about it, simply because when we do the lecture, you'll be a very good anchor on the ground to give an experience. So yeah, that's too close to it. We just took the drive around and you could just look at it in the distance. <laughs> oh, great. 
I know I would have liked to have gone and climbed around and in and out, but um, we didn't have enough time or something. So okay. Just, there's that a drive that you can take all the way around the area. And then okay. there's a visitor center and a film and you know, all that. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I got some questions for you. So once my turn, I'll-, I'll oh, okay, okay, then well, well I'm, I'm just gonna relax and take your questions, go for it. <laughs> well, first of all, you said something about that raised door. Well, you said lowered the doorway, but it looked like it had been raised to make it smaller. You know, because the stones were at the bottom of the door. Yeah, so, so, so sorry, oh. sorry, sorry. As I was pointing at it, it's, it's probably the way I'm interpreting my words sometimes. Yeah, they, 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 um, they, they raised it. Um, when, I, when, I, when I met, I used the word lowered. Um, they, they, um, oh. <laughs> they, they, right. they lowered the access. That's what I was trying to say. Sorry, I, I used yeah. the wrong words there. Yeah, you, you're right. They raised it. They, 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 they made it much smaller. Um, and obviously that's probably for an engineering, um, engineering reason rather than anything else. You, you see it with lots of the doors with that complex. You have next. to climb over the, art, the doorway. You have to clamber over it to get to the next room. Yes, you would have. And, and it wasn't blocked up though. That's... Right, okay. Yeah, that, that's question. interesting. <laughs> Um, how big was that macaw? There was a little measurement there, but I didn't know how big that measurement was. Are they, you know, like head size or? No, the, these these are not small birds. Um, uh, the, 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 pro the problem is there is no scale with it. And I'm assuming that they're, they're the big parrots, not the small ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also that, that could... That could be a bit of homework for next week. When you're when you're doing something like this, you get frustrating areas with old <laughs> reports. You just can't get those little things that I need. Yeah, that's all right. What about those um, mugs that they found um, cacao in it or something? Is that a drug? Cacao. No, that that's that that's the that's your base instrument for chocolate. Chocolate. Okay, that was cacao. That stuff. that's your hot chocolate. Ba basically, they do it as a drink now in Mexico. You go into a bar. And, and you can have a, a cocoa paste drink, right? right? It tastes very bitter and you add honey to it. But right. basically that is hot chocolate. Right. When I was in Europe, in the, well, Prague and all those places, every place I'd ask for hot chocolate, and every place they did it totally different. <laughs> you know, oh. looked, every taste did it, they had different things, the way they added it and the way they did it, you know, I'm serious, a mystery. Every country yeah. had a different way of presenting you hot chocolate. <laughs> uh, and this all comes back to, yeah, the, the thing is, what, when, when we think about cocoa, uh, we always think, you know, I, I did this with the young explorers on, on Wednesday. And I said, you know, um, you know they're, they're drinking hot chocolates, you know, a thousand years ago. And they say, oh, no, it was invented by Cadbury's in 18 something or other. And I was just thinking, hang on a minute, guys, right? This is why we do archaeology, because the archaeological evidence is actually on the, on the vessels themselves to say that they did drink hot chocolate. It tasted different, but then again, the hot chocolate that you said that you're drinking in Europe tasted different. So it's exactly the same point. It's five different ways they presented it to you. Yeah, exactly. You know, I can't believe it. <laughs> Some they had the liquid chocolate in the bottom. You had to add the hot milk and stir it yourself, and it's really hmm. weird. I, I, yeah, I, I mean cocoa. Cocoa on its own tastes horrible with hot water. You know, it's it, it, cocoa, but. Hot chocolate has got sugar and things in it, you know, drinking chocolate. Exactly. They, 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 you know, even, even the stuff that I know the stuff you're describing, the Bourne, the Bourneville chocolate. Bourneville. Yeah, that's right. It, it doesn't taste, it, it doesn't taste like chocolate at all. You've got to add loads no. of sugar. Yeah. Um, I got some more know, questions. What, how many questions we got Two. Just a couple more. Um, oh. Was there a roof on these kivas? Uh, yes, like, yes. Yes, there were roofs on these kivas. The, the, the biggest, obviously, when you think about it, the most earlier kivas, the biggest kiva, they must have felled the biggest tree possible that they had to actually roof that span. And obviously, um, that wood would have lasted many hundreds of years. And the, some, lots of the original timbers are still there. So, you know, the yeah. roof would have, you know, pine wood, decent pine wood, um, not that, that cheap, cheap pine that you, you import from um, Norway. Not that stuff that you get from Ikea, but the good old pine, that good stuff, I like the Scots pine, that lasts for ever. 
but, but it's such a wide space. You need lots it of is. supports, wouldn't you, all across the yeah. board? Well, if you've got if you've got one if you have several tree trunks across the whole thing, it it would be fine. Right, mm -hmm. supporting it upwards, yeah. Um, no, no, no. Just, just if, if you if you got a, tr a thin tree trunk, because this would have been a big forest. There would have been long lengths. They just just a complete bough of timber um, that, that could have stretched across the whole thing. Uh, however, yeah. I, but however, um, you could actually corbel over using timber as well. So let's just not, let's keep the jury out on that. Don't give that as bible. Go on, Pat. <coughs> okay. The, the flat support. I've got to go. Sorry. Okay. Okay, Dell. I'll see you on Saturday, maybe. Bye. Yeah. Bye. bye. Take bye. care, Dell. Bye bye. 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 Go on, Pat. Let's have the other one. Oh, right. Um, the doorways. Um, they had flat supports, but they looked like they were cracked in various areas. They didn't look like a straight length. They looked like there was two or three pieces across there sometimes. Um, I, I know what you're talking about, and I've seen that myself. But obviously, um, the, these are these are a number of a stone beam so you've got one stone beam another stone beam and that yeah. that inter intermingling taking the weight yeah. above so that would actually work like if you've brick, just got yeah. one piece of one piece of rock across the whole thing and that right. fractures then you're going to get problems but it's going to be different and basically else, it, it, it yeah. over compensates yeah. yes like bricks yes uh, what about this all this darkness i mean it should have been really dark what sort of lamps did they use we do have we do have evidence of, of residue that they've actually got oil lamps. We we yeah. they have actually found oil lamps with the site, but they would have still been relatively dark. Mm -hmm. However, there however, in, in the daylight, there's a lot of daylight there. So you know, after not, all, not down three stories. You can't get a daylight down three stories. No, 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 no. You wouldn't. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly, exactly. That's it. <laughs> you know, anyway, like, it's more like cellars, really. You know. Sellers. Like the one that uh, your husband keeps you down, exactly. Yeah. Um, right, so any other, any, any other questions before we go? Have you all enjoyed that today? Yeah, very thank much. you very much. Very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, and, I, and obviously I, I would say that um, those in Arnside pass on their regards. <laughs> they, they, they refer to you as the splinter group from Arnside. <laughs> uh, so um and uh, bill oh. bill has bill has actually joined the skype class on a tuesday evening because he can't oh, that's use right. Zoom. that's right that's right Good. he wanted he wanted to come with us but he couldn't get on zoom he couldn't get zoom but he's gonna ask richard if he can get him his son if he can get him on well that's exactly. good that'll be good Right. See, I think he'd like to be with us. I, I, I know, I know. He doesn't want to be with the with the tosh that is the. Yeah, <laughs> I know Peter, though. Peter. Hmm. Um. Any, anyway, so if there's no more questions, if anyone wants to chat afterwards, they can. Um. I'm going to call that a day now. Thank um, you very much. It's yes, my pleasure, you. Henry. Um, I'll take you by. Um, you. See you, Henry and Anne and Anne and the other Anne and um, <laughs> Tina and Pat. Anyone wants to chat can, and I will see you. Um, Thank you. I, 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 will, I, will, I will see you on Saturday, hopefully. Sure. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. What did you think of that idea, Carl? Did you get that message? Hang on, that's one of my trees. Yeah. I was thinking of making some cards out of it. I, 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 you know, did, it's when, your copyright. But hang I on a minute. It... <laughs> hang on a minute. When, when was that the one on my wall? Yeah, I must have taken a photo of it. And and I I would love you to make that into a card. Go for it. That, right. that, that can be I the Archaeology Cymru Christmas card. Oh. Yeah. Well, I thought we could, uh, talk, you know, donate to the NHS, you know, and um, put all archaeology stuff on it. <laughs> what tree is it? I've never seen that tree. Me? Yeah, but where was it? Where'd you he, see it? He painted it about, oh, God. Ten years ago, five years ago. No, ac actually, um, no. I painted it thirteen years ago. Thank you very much. Oh, thirteen! Oh my 13. God! Uh, Where is it? That that, that, is that that's on the wall in my house somewhere. <laughs> but no, the only it's... thing is, Carl, I can't make it any bigger. I'm having problems, but never mind. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I'll take a photo of it and try and enlarge it. All right, then. Okay. That's great. Okay, then that's great. Anne. Anne comes out with wonderful things now and again. 
<laughs> hey, what you need to do, you need to have a chat with Rosamond about that on Wednesday. Anyway, night night, uh, night night. See you guys. I'll see you um, okay, Saturday, you. Well, whenever. Yeah, I'll Wednesday. see you Saturday. Oh, you're not joining us on Saturday are you for the ghosty no. thing? All right. No, Wednesday. All right, then. See you Wednesday. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Get off. <laughs>